Hello, <laughs> distinguished speakers. Before we begin, since we are in the year 2014, the first thing I need to do is tell you about health and safety issues here. Um, to start off with, uh, the fire alarm will go if there is a fire, and the muster point you will go to is right out in the quad where you came in, some of you anyway, into the King's foyer. Um, we have fire marshals here. Uh, Katie over here has just completed a fire marshal training <laughs> and other fire marshals out in uh, the reception. Um, please do not touch any of the switches in between the entrance doors and the, the uh, lecture theatre because they will plunge the entire room into darkness. Uh, they're not just for the foyer area. So that's a uh, little something. They look like lights, but don't touch them. Um, the badges are supposed to be kept on for the whole conference for entry and exit for security reasons. Um, in terms of what is being filmed here today, it's only the speakers who are being filmed. When um, we have questions and answer sessions, your questions will not be picked up on the film and therefore the speaker will reply to your question by initially restating your question. But do not fear, you are not going to be recorded on a video. This is just for us. Um, what else? If you tweet, please use hashtag JesusAndBrian14. That's the preferred format we have. But please go ahead and tweet all you like. We're very happy about that. Um, and finally, there are limited tickets still available outside if you uh, would like to purchase any more tickets for the conference. So that is the health and safety notices. And now the clock has struck 4.30, as it were, and I can begin to open this conference. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the King's College London Jesus and Brian conference, what have the Pythons done for us? This conference will celebrate Monty Python's life of Brian and use it as a means of exploring all manner of things related to Jesus and history and also the reception of the film. I'm delighted that we have here this weekend an illustrious group of scholars, all foremost in their fields, spanning a range of disciplines, but all having in common an interest, dare I say, a love of the life of Brian. I am thrilled, too, that we have tonight both Terry Jones and John Cleese coming to engage in conversation with Richard Burridge on the initial reception of the film and also reflecting on it after these 35 years <laughs> since it first appeared among us. I would like to thank at the very outset Philip Davies for giving me Terry Jones's email <laughs> when I first thought of this conference. Philip was the first Brianologist with his article Life of Brian Research in 1998 and he planted the seed for what would grow to be a great tree today. I thank also Terry Jones in Absentia, who kindly got in touch with all the Pythons. He was so excited about the idea of the conference. And one Sunday, Sunday afternoon, I suddenly got a call out of the blue from John Cleese giving me his support. I just answered my mobile with this <laughs> unknown number and he said, hello, it's John Cleese speaking. <laughs> practically died. Um, but since, <laughs> since then, he's been a very keen supporter and I've had conversations with him on the phone by email um, and he actually regrets that he can't be more involved in the, in the conference this weekend because of O2 show uh, rehearsals. I thank also in absentia Michael Palin, who also can't be here, but has been very much supportive of the conference and this led to an invitation to appear on the Today programme, and I was very, very glad to pass this over to my colleague, 
Richard Burridge, who did a brilliant job in coming on the Today programme and talking about uh, the life of Brian. Uh, this got picked up worldwide throughout the media um, and even had Jeremy Clarkson responding indignantly to Richard on uh, one occasion. But this is, you know, no publicity is bad publicity. It was, it was really great. And I thank Richard Burridge for all the support and, uh, and encouragement he's given throughout uh, this journey to put on this, this conference. So um, look forward very much to this co conversation with Richard later on. Uh, they're arriving at a not quite certain time, sometime during the reception, and I will go out to meet them and, and bring them in for 7.30 here in the Safra. I thank also our conference supporters, Bloomsbury TNT Clark, who have been incredibly enthusiastic about the idea and have agreed to publish the conference book. They are also supporting this, this <coughs> conference in numerous ways, and I really thank uh, Dominic Matos and his team from Bloomsbury. So, the life of Brian. I have to say I was a fervent Pythonist in my youth. But when life of Brian revealed itself to us, I did not answer the call to follow, and instead I let it scream without actually going to a picture theatre to see it. And really, that was because I was of little faith and thought that it would ridicule Jesus, and I didn't want to see a film that would ridicule Jesus. However, it was seven years, with physical <laughs> number, seven years later, I actually went to see a film, the, a screening of The Life of Brian, and found it absolutely fantastic, as all of you here, I hope, find the film, uh, and a means of giving us illumination into Jesus and his times, all the popular fronts for the liberation of Judea. I love the provocation in terms of the historical Jesus. I'm with James Crossley and Philip Davies on this. It's not a blasphemous film, but it is a subversive film. And we need this subversion. I relish the way it challenges, it makes us, as scholars of the period, laugh at ourselves. It makes us squirm with recognition. It even has the messianic secret in it. We will hear over the next few days papers ranging from the historical to the filmic considering reception, art, what the Romans did for the Judeans or not. There's tremendous diversity, but all the papers are linked with a serious wish to engage with the film that has so many bizarrely relevant things for us, even after all these years. Many a true word was said in jest, as they say. I've encouraged participants in this conference to use a particular kind of methodology. In usual forms of reception history, as it is called, biblical scholars can trace the ways in which the biblical texts have been used over the centuries, whether in exegesis, understanding the text, literature, art, drama, music, or film. The study is essentially linear. The biblical text is written, and then it is received, and on and on and on, and we explore the whys and wherefores of that process. However, a new way of looking at reception was brought into being by uh, an article, a work by Larry Kreitzer, and, talk, and he talked about reversing the hermeneutical flow, thinking about how the science of interpretation, hermeneutics, can be turned around. So it is a tool by which we analyze biblical texts, and I extrapolate from that, history itself. In the recent work of my colleague Paul Joyce with my former colleague Diana Lipton, in their study of Lamentations, they talk about reception exegesis. They ask how the various items of reception can make us think again and ask questions of the biblical texts under review. This is exactly what I have been doing in my MA module taught here at King's, The Passion, uh, module asks students to look at different items of reception like film, literature, art, and then 
take those and, and look again at a, a passage of the Passion, narratives and rethink, dancing between the reception and the text to bring out more aspects of the text. So in this conference, let us use the life of Brian as a hermeneutical tool, as a means of reflecting not only on our text, but on the Jesus of history and on his context in first century uh, Judea. So what I thought I'd do in just 20 minutes uh, before I introduce our first speaker is show how I would do this kind of job of reception exegesis utilising uh, the life of Brian. And I will find the PowerPoint here and it will all go well. Ah, okay, right, here we go. Slideshow. Right, so I am going to talk about the historical Brian. Now, for me, what strikes me most about the life of Brian is the portrayal of this historical Brian and what the historical Brian tells us about the historical Jesus as an aside. First of all, what, I, what do I mean by the historical Jesus, for those of you who haven't studied in this field? When Monty Python's Life of Brian arrived in cinemas in 1979, audiences were quite familiar with the biblical ethics that purported to tell the story of the life of Jesus. But for biblical scholars, it was quite clear that what they were really presenting was a very faith-based presentation <coughs> of Jesus. What in biblical scholarship is defined as the Christ of faith, Thinking about the historical Jesus is actually an attempt to think about Jesus as a human being, a man living in Judea in the first century. However, in, in the films that we see, in the King of Kings, for example, that came out in 1961, this Jesus of Hollywood, as Adele Reinhardt uh, talks about the figure, is really the Christ of faith in our terms. Uh, there's no attempt to really present him as a, as a human being. And we see in this kind of template of the King of Kings, and, and this lovely little subtitle there, the life of Christ intelligently told and beautifully filmed, full of deeply moving moments. You know, that is what we were expecting from films. We would be um, encouraged to wonder the, the soundtrack with choirs, of angels singing um, whenever anything happened like he moved from Galilee to Jerusalem or up a mountain or wherever. Then along came the life of Brian with its movie poster exactly copying the cut and stone towering edifice of the King of Kings titled words, not Jesus but Brian, the ordinary man. While in the movie King of Kings there is a focus on Jesus grandly standing on the Mount of Beatitudes and delivering the lines of Matthew's Gospel with all the wooden dignity every actor who played Jesus had to muster. What we have in Brian is an explicit zooming in on this group of people right at the very back. And they're people who are standing not in these respectful poses of quiet attention that we get in the uh, usual movies of, of Jesus, um, but they're talking, they're arguing, and they're not hearing properly. And so we get this wonderful line of, uh, blessed are the cheesemakers, or blessed are the, the peacemakers. But this scene is important for more than the comedy of the misheard line. It gives us these ordinary people. Brian straining to hear above the snarky, well-to-do companion, these words, is an ordinary man. In being this, beside a Jesus in the life of Brian, who is actually just as dignified and wooden as in the King of Kings, it challenges us to recognize the man missed from history, namely Brian himself. As James Crossley has explored, this ordinary Brian does make us consider also a possibility of a very different Jesus to the Christ of faith we see in Hollywood, which is why the film is subversive. Yet, 
in the Synoptic Gospels themselves, the, the scene of the transfiguration should warn us against seeing the historical Jesus in this way, as this kind of transformed uh, godly figure. It's only in the transfiguration scene in Mark 9 and parallels that Jesus' clothing was changed to become glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could possibly bleach them in Mark 9, 3. He is transformed then into wearing this quasi-heavenly attire. But in our King of Kings, Jesus, um, or other films of the time, Jesus is sort of always wearing this glistening white. And uh, we get it time and time again. There's this white figure um, in, in the way uh, Jesus is presented. And the one thing we know then uh, about the historical Jesus, Jesus the man, on, on the basis of the synoptic gospels themselves, is he did not wear very white clothing. It becomes the cipher for identifying this Christ of faith, this um, reworked Jesus that you have in, in the Hollywood movies. But more than anything, the life of Brian gives us Brian. And we see the world through his eyes. He's the ordinary man that has been left out of the pages of history, one of the oklos, the crowd, the man who would never be king, never be great, never be one to change the course of history. We have exactly the kind of man Josephus, the historian of the first century, would find intolerable as one of the common crowd, one of that populace of Judea who can run off after false prophets, revolt, get massacred by irate Roman governors, die in famines, protest, and generally prove troublesome in one way or another to the elite, such as Josephus. Brian of Nazareth, Brian Cohen. The historical Brians never actually have a voice in history. So I'm going to do with Brian what we can do with Jesus' name. Now, Jesus' name, Jesus' son of Joseph, as we have him in uh, the Gospels. We know, actually, that he was called Yeshua, that then became Jesus, that then became Jesus, then become Jesus for us. And his uh, uh, paternal name is by Joseph, son of uh, Joseph. So, Brian, I'm going to call him the historical Bahanan, using that as a, a parallel. So his mother Mandy is named as in Latin Amanda, deserving to be loved. Really, the perfect nickname for a Roman friendly prostitute. As Tal Ilan has shown in her list of names, such Latin names for Jews were well known in Judea. I'm interested in the Bar Hanans and Amandas of first century Galilee and Judea as a whole, the ordinary people. The life of Brian points us, challenges us, to think of them. So then on to Brian's dad, <laughs> Hanan. Well, if the second name was Cohen, <laughs> the fact that uh, it, he might have got it from his dad uh, is slightly problematic and an interesting twist, as it would put poor Bar Hanan into the category of priests who were somewhat marginal um, because in terms of the, the, the rules on uh, priests, a priest must not defile, uh, must not marry a woman defiled by prostitution or divorced. So clearly, whatever's going on in terms of, of Brian's background as a Cohen, um, there's something not quite right. But it makes me think, using this particular motif, it makes me think then, of the character of Levi in Mark 2, 13 to 17. Um, his name, normally, Levi, would be associated with the class of Levites, who are the, the wider group to which the uh, priests belong. And the rules for Levites were also reasonably strict in terms of what they should do. And it's exactly this reason that in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, he can use the category of a priest and a Levite as righteous and upstanding members of society before he draws on the shocking example of a Samaritan as one who actually shows the compassion 
God wants in Luke 10, 25 to 37, as Amy Jill Levine has discussed. Brian Cohen is then of the same ilk as Levi the tax collector, one of Jesus' closest followers in the Synoptic Gospels. Brian and Mandy, as our historical Bahanan and Amanda, representing the poor of Galilean society, have been illuminated of late by archaeological discoveries in Galilee, which shows us the kind of material that is lost from the pages of history written by elites. At Capernaum, uh, Jesus' home base, we have the poor houses of the Bahanans and the Amandas of the world. We see their cooking pots, their lost coins in these houses. And you can see also how densely packed they are. They're very, very poorly built in black basalt. They're cramped spaces. Archaeologists and historians have identified the problems faced by the ordinary people of Galilee as overpopulation, a strain of available arable land to sustain this population, and simple disease. This is borne out in both text and stress the high population of Judea and also archaeological data. From a democratic, demographic perspective, in the words of Jonathan Reed, who has particularly studied this question, survival depended on extended family networks, especially for the most vulnerable, old women and young children. The ancient Mediterranean was, in Walter Scheidel's words, a place of frequent pregnancy and sudden death. <coughs> Jesus Galilee was a tough place to be. Then in terms of our conception of the poor, in seeing them in, uh, as in regard to the Hollywood movies as these very docile and obedient <coughs> figures in the background on the Sermon of the Mount waiting to be waiting to hear Jesus' wonderful words, isn't really right. Were they any more docile, meek, and prone to adoration as the poor of the Brazilian favelas? Were the marginalized women who worked as prostitutes in order to survive? I can well understand how they might have wanted to put on beards, dresses, men, and stone someone in public. These are people who have no power in terms of uh, their general daily life. They could also indeed be classified as the sinners, the wrongdoers, the hematoloid in terms of um, our biblical material. So in making the ordinary man their hero in Python's Life of Brian, we look through his eyes at a world that is completely absurd. Because how can a world be anything but absurd if you are in this category of the poor, the downtrodden, uh, the marginal, those who are defined as hamartaloi, the wrongdoers, by the good, by the wealthy and the elite of society. So it makes sense then of lines like we have in the Gospel of John 1.46 when Nathaniel snorts what good can come from Nazareth. Um, perhaps that's, that also indicates the lowly nature of the town. Um, Brian's was also a birth that is, um, oh sorry, I will move back here, that is among the, the, the meek and lowly in a stable and put, he's put in a cattle feeding truck trough with only his mum, Mandy, on her own, not even with a kindly Joseph by her side, let alone a star which is shining at the house down the end of the road. So using this motif, let us note that Mandy and Brian are precisely in this category of the prostitutes and tax collectors that Jesus hung out with. So he reclines at table, Jesus reclines at table in the place with uh, tax collectors and sinners, wrongdoers, as I've translated here, um, and he's criticized for it. He uh, enjoys their company. He says it's because um, they need a healer, the, the righteous ones don't need a healer. Um, and he knows that he's being criticized. So Jesus can reply 
Uh, this is how I translate the son of man. <laughs> this man's son came eating and drinking, and they say, look, greedy man and a drinker, a friend of tax collectors and wrongdoers. But wisdom is vindicated by her actions. Jesus is going to take the side of those who were um, at the bottom of society. So what we have with, um, with uh, the life of Brian is this Bahanan, this Brian who is this ordinary man, poor, marginal, in all sorts of different ways. And he actually represents this figure from uh, the, the teaching of Jesus, who is counted as nothing. But Jesus' teaching would say that he is actually very dear to God. Brian has few joys in life, and his only real joy was very short-lived indeed. He's permanently anxious and confused by the mad world around him. The prefect of Judea is a fool. The priests paranoid about blasphemy, but missing the point of true worship. And the Romans crucify you for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This film asks us to think of a Jesus who could also laugh at this absurdity. So another element I would like to use here, really, and close with, is the very element of humour that we see in the life of Brian. In her work on parables, Amy Jill Levine has been alert to this humorous element. And I think it's really, really important. In the wooden Hollywood Jesus, in the Christ of faith even, it's really hard to imagine Jesus laughing. He's always sort of very composed. But how can he really have been human if he couldn't have shared a joke with someone and laughed at things. Especially laughing at people who criticised him, the people who said, oh, you know, why is he hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes and wrongdoers? He seems to have jibed back in a way that um, indicated that he was completely aiming at their sore point. Um, so there they are in the slide, uh, that the references here, the, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling. He turns back to them and says, oh, they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Well, you know, for most Bible readers today, that doesn't mean a huge amount. <laughs> but um, these were things that indicated your piety a phylactery, a man would wear it with, with passages from Torah inside it, um, a part of piety, part of prayer, and zitzit, the, the fringes are what they would wear as a Jewish man differentiating themselves from uh, the nations as Numbers 1538 prescribes. So this kind of identification of someone being laughable on the basis of what they are wearing or doing with their dress is interesting in the light of what we have in regard to the reception of the life of Brian. Because there with uh, Mervyn Stockwood, he came along in this purple bishop's attire and, and had this great uh, huge cross and, 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 uh, and hanging down which he was sort of fingered with and this great um, ring. And that's exactly what not the nine o'clock news chose to pick up on in terms of paradigm, parodying, in terms of um, basically uh, pricking the bubble of the pompousness that was in Mervyn Stockwood's uh, response to the Pythons. So this kind of thing is, uh, I think, very reflective of the humour that is so hard for us to read in Jesus' sayings. But I would like to see him as a funny man, as someone whose humour would appeal to the ordinary man, the ordinary Brian's, the historical Bahanai. Okay. So with this short exercise in method, and let me just show you some ordinary people from Bombay <laughs> to close, um, I am now going to introduce our first session of the conference itself. Uh, the first formal session of the conference with Professor Martin Goodman and Professor George Brook.
I am not going to engage in lengthy uh, introductions because I want us to get into the papers themselves and you have everything that you want to know about our speakers in our program, so I urge you to read over uh, who they are and where they came from. Uh, but it is my great pleasure now to welcome to the stage Professor Martin Goodman, who will speak about first century Judea. Thank you. I was uh, teaching uh, Greek and Roman history in the University of Birmingham uh, in the late 1970s uh, when Monty Python's Life of Brian uh, first came out. And I've been using a, a number of teaching aids in order to try to, to bring history to life for students. Uh, for, for Roman imperial history, I encourage them to read uh, Robert Graves' I, Claudius, and the, the TV production with Derek Jacobi uh, was uh, quite recent, and somehow that seemed to get their eyes alight, and they could imagine themselves in the imperial court. Tried with slightly less success to get them to read Gore Vidal, on Julian in the fourth century. Um, and uh, they got stuck, I think, in some 20th century issues uh, that uh, Vidal had brought into what is actually a brilliant biography. I think my least successful effort uh, was trying to teach about the barbarian invasions of the fifth century West and the fall of Rome in 410 by getting a, a seminar to listen to a Radio 3 uh, play with the barbarians on the one side and the Romans on the other. And there's little more agonizing as a teacher than sitting listening to uh, the sound of the tape whirring and realizing that the entire class is going to sleep and that you're not quite sure whether you should intervene or wait till the last one nods off. Uh, and that was a mistake. Uh, but uh, by 79, I was allowed to teach a, a final year option in the area I'd been working on, namely Jewish history, and an option on Roman Palestine. And the teaching of that course was transformed by the arrival of Brian. It seemed to me at the time to be extraordinarily accurate in its portrayal of first century Judea. And in many respects, I've continued to think it's astonishing. And I'm hoping by the end of this conference, we'll get more of an insight as to exactly how they did get so many things right. And the enthusiasm of the students, in this case, could be taken for granted. We didn't have DVDs and things, so they had to be told to go off and actually watch it, to watch the film. But as will be familiar to most people here, uh, once they'd watched the film, it was then sort of hardwired into them, and uh, actually it became something of a problem that whenever one was dealing with particular topics, like the role of the priesthood in first century Judea in the temple, people would start giggling, and you have to work back through the the script of Life of Brian to work out what you just said that uh, caused uh, the laughter. Uh, it wasn't quite so easy uh, to share Life of Brian insights when I began about a year later uh, to teach the same course on Roman Palestine in an evening extramural class, uh, also in Birmingham, which I did for quite a number of years with more mature students, covering just the same material. Quotes from the film, or allusions to the film, could elicit a very stony response. And I, I learnt, so this would be the early 80s, I learnt to be very cautious. So if the students came up with quotes, which they did, then you'd wait to see how many of the class found it amusing. 
Um, and uh, from the position of a teacher, it seemed unwise even to draw their attention to the parallel between what we were looking at and what you could see uh, in the life of Brian on the screen. So it became clear that for the general public interested in this period of history, for quite complex reasons, their attitude to the life of Brian was itself quite divided. Now, now in retrospect, uh, my enthusiasm for the life of Brian uh, was partly because it's a very good film, but partly because the focus of the course was on the outbreak and the course of the first Jewish revolt of 66 to 70. The fine distinctions between the Judean People's Front and the People's Front of Judea seemed spot on for the divisions in Jerusalem just before the destruction of the city in 70 CE, discussed in great detail by the Jewish historian Josephus and also by the outside observer, the senatorial historian Tacitus. It didn't matter that it was also extremely accurate for divisions in Marxist student politics in the University of Birmingham at the same time. Very accurate, too, seemed to be the uh, incidental use of crucifixion as just a matter-of-fact way of disposing of uh, those seen by the state, the Roman state, as being uh, in the way. Uh, and uh, that uh, picture that comes all over Josephus' Jewish war as he's talking about the course of the war. In general, the picture in the life of Brian of a, a society on the edge of manic hysteria about to break down fitted really well with the story that I was trying to tell of the events that led up to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70. I was particularly keen on the Roman governor getting furious at the Jews laughing at him when he proclaimed, Rome was your friend, since I had a theory, and he goes on, uh, since I had a theory that uh, Josephus' story, that a heavy-handed joke by the Jews at the expense of the governor of Florus in the year 66 CE played an important role uh, in the events leading up to the outbreak of that disastrous revolt. Uh, but, that explains why I was keen on it, but as this conference reveals, the biggest impact of the life of Brian has not been on those studying that period of Roman Palestine. An understanding of the Great Revolt of 66 to 70 for students of Roman history and students of Jewish history is by far the most significant event of the first century. It was the most important rebellion within a settled Roman province throughout the imperial period in terms of its impact on wider Roman history and the amount of Roman forces that were used. And for Jewish history, it marked the end, down to our own days, of the standard method of Jewish worship of their God uh, through sacrifices and offerings in the temple in Jerusalem. But it's less obviously so crucial, uh, this first revolt, uh, for an understanding of the less dramatic events which we're going to have in the event, even greater historical con consequences that happened in Judea 40 years earlier. And I take it that Brian's dazzling career is presumably to be dated round about 30 CE, at the time of Jesus. Uh, and here, uh, it seems to me that the film may be slightly less helpful in some of the depictions of the way in which Roman rule operated in Judea uh, and in the uh, reactions of the Jews to it. But the issue is essentially one of hindsight. 
all our main sources for the history of first century Judea were composed after the Great Revolt of 66 to 70, and in the knowledge of what was going to happen when Roman rule in Judea broke down. So the only full narrative of Judean politics in the first century was written by the Jerusalem politician Josephus, whose first foray into historiography in the 70s CE was precisely to seek the causes of the war of 66 to 70, in which he'd been a participant by combing the narrative of the previous 60 years in order to find incidents which might explain the growth of tensions which had exploded so dramatically in 66. So the question for the life of Brian is which elements of the depiction of Judean society in life of Brian might one now question for the time of Brian himself in 30 CE, just 24 years after the imposition of direct Roman rule. Uh, perhaps I should begin with the most celebrated. All right, but apart from the sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, the freshwater system, and public health. You can finish it off. What have the Romans done for us? There's a parallel. And again, I don't know, perhaps we'll find out uh, whether the Pythons were aware of it uh, in the Babylonian Talmud. Rabbi Judah, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai were sitting and Yehuda ben Gerim was sitting near them. Rabbi Judah began and said, how great are the deeds of this Roman nation. They made markets, they made bathhouses, they made bridges. Rabbi Yossi was silent. Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai answered and said, what they made, they made for themselves. They made markets so they could set prostitutes there, bathhouses so they could enjoy themselves, bridges to collect a toll. These comments by Shimon Bar Yochai don't end well in the story. Judah ben Gerim, not otherwise known, evidently thought of as the offspring of proselytes, went and told the authorities, and Shimon Bar Yochai had to escape and ended up in the cave for 12 years. The whole point though, of this Talmudic story, which we have here from Babylonian Talmud, compiled round about 600 CE, so approximately 570 years after the time of Brian, the whole point of the Talmudic story is that it was about rabbis of the period of the War of Bar Kokhba, of 132 to 135, that is to say, a hundred years after the time of Brian. And Shimon Bar Yahai is the hero of it because he was a well-known victim of that war as one uh, who had opposed Roman rule. So just like Josephus, the story with all, within all our rabbinic texts are there talking about Roman rule uh, with the knowledge that it was all going to go horribly, horribly wrong. Now, the Romans were indeed quite capable of using spending on infrastructure in order to control the natives. I, I paraphrase, what have the Romans done for us? Uh, Tacitus, uh, writing about the Roman governor of Britain, Agricola, in the 70th CE, is quite explicit. That's what Agricola did. He built them towns and he got the Britons to move in, as a result of which they lost the desire to rebel. It's an idealized picture from Tacitus, but it shows the Romans could think that way. 
But they've not done much yet to stamp a Roman facade on Judea. So if we think of Judea in 30 CE, what has much more to be seen within the country is the impact of the massive recent building by Herod the Great. A great deal of it, of course, still uh, to be seen within the province. And that degree of spending on the province had actually come to, to an end, uh, as far as we know, uh, in 6 CE, at the point at to which uh, direct Roman rule began. Now, we're told by Josephus that Pontius Pilate did try to use public finances for aqueduct building, but made himself unpopular by using the wrong money so that he was accused of impiety. So we can see that this kind of infrastructure building was on its way, but actually at this particular point in 30, this is not a picture of Roman imperialism that yet would be standard, I think, uh, in Judea as a province which has only just come under direct Roman rule. Uh, conversely, on the other side, the Romans had not yet done enough, or done as much as they were going to do, to annoy the Jews, to create this sense of a society on the edge of rebellion that runs through the life of Brian and runs through our picture of Jewish history, uh, Judean history, in 66. And the evidence for that is that there was not yet a need for a huge Roman garrison to keep the peace. The Roman senatorial historian Tacitus notoriously noted when he was talking about Judea uh, in the time of Brian, in his own, let's say Tacitus' own account of the troubles which led to the revolt in 66 CE, that sub Tiberio quies, that under Tiberius, so from 14 to 37 CE, nothing much happened in Judea. That's in terms of uh, newspaper headlines in the Roman press. Uh, nothing to talk about uh, for a senator, senatorial historian. And it is the case that Pontius Pilate was left in his post as governor for many years. Uh, sources which are uh, uniformly and, uh, opposed to Tiberius for all sorts of good imperial political reasons say that this was because Tiberius was lazy and enjoying himself too much on the island of Capri to get round to changing governors and to uh, uh, replacing a bad governor uh, for a new one. And I don't doubt either that the Emperor Tiberius was lazy or enjoying himself on Capri, or that Pilate was not a nice man. And we have this not just from Josephus, um, but also from uh, Pilate's contemporary, uh, the philosopher Philo. But he was left in post for a very long time. Actually, quite how long has been debated, but a very long time, uh, whatever the answer is. Uh, and he was left there with a very s small garrison. So, so the picture in life of Brian of a society under occupation with Roman soldiers liable to give you a severe Latin lesson if you write Romanes Aunt Domus. It's misleading on, on a number of levels. There were so few troops in the standing Roman army in Judea, probably at this point around about 1800 for the whole country. So few troops that the chances you would be caught by one of them writing your graffiti was, fortunately, vanishingly small. You had to be really stupid to get caught. <laughs> but also, when you got caught, 
The soldier himself was likely to be a Greek-speaking auxiliary from Sebasti or one of the other uh, uh, cities in the regions of Judea uh, with Latin just as bad as yours. Um, and if we look at military Latin, they couldn't spell. And uh, beyond the sort of the basics of being told quick march, there was no need for soldiers in the auxiliaries uh, to do any better. Now, th 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 those are two cases in which the general image that emerges from life of Brian into the wider consciousness uh, seems to me to have a, quite an important impact. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the question. Th does it really matter if a film as uh, pervasive as Life of Brian uh, has a picture of Judean society in the time of not just Brian, but his contemporary Jesus, uh, that is on the edge of revolt and under control from an imperialist system with a large force that is clamping down on the possibilities of uh, rebellion? Well, I think the answer is, probably fortunately for this conference, I think the answer is yes, that it does matter. That the film images from a masterpiece like Life of Brian are very powerful and very pervasive. And the image of the Brian movement, and by extension the Jesus movement, as a response to imperialist oppression, which maybe we'll learn more during this conference, may well have had its origins, at least partly, in the politics of the 1970s, nonetheless must inevitably, for the millions who've imbibed the film, become part of their view of the way in which Christianity originated and the impetus to the movement around Jesus from which the church would be to, was to arise. And it would be fascinating to learn in the course of this conference from colleagues much more qualified than I who work on New Testament liberation theology to what extent the images of the life of Brian have fed in to that kind of approach to New Testament studies over the past 35 years. Um, I invite any questions from the floor. This is a, a conference where we have allowed for generous question time so that you can uh, participate and ask anything of our eminent speakers. Um, as I said before, your questions are not going to be recorded on the film, so the speaker will need to uh, just say your question again before replying. So any questions, please, for Professor Goodman. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so, 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 so the question was this right? the question um, um, the, the, the question was whether uh, there was uh, indeed a great deal of uh, discontent in 30 CE, and the only thing that sort of changed by 66 to 70 was the emergence of leaders of that discontent to lead to a political rebellion. Uh, and the answer, of course, is until we have the, the records of the uh, rebellion, it's hard to tell <coughs> whether society 
uh, is uh, discontented because, as Jen told us eloquently uh, in her introduction, uh, the, 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 the ordinary people don't get a voice in the historical record. Uh, but what seems to me striking uh, is that uh, our historian Josephus, who in the end tells us about the, uh, the work of the elite, the role of the elite in leading the rebellion in 66 to 70, uh, did so against his own uh, inclinations because he wanted to claim that elite should have been left in power in Judea and with a desire as far as possible to look for uh, an explanation of what went wrong in 66 to 70 within the wider community in particular what he would describe as uh, the lower classes um, and it, Part of his trying to do that was to look in the, in the narrative from 6 to 66 for as much evidence as he could for popular uprisings and for groups that went and out into the desert and uh, uh, opposed Roman rule in sometimes uh, somewhat over-optimistic ways, meaning they waited for God to intervene. But in your period from 6 to 66, the most that uh, Josephus could come up with was 10 uh, occasions when something happened. And these are different levels of seriousness within the politics of Judea. Um, so uh, the great uprising against Gaius Caligula when he wanted to put his statue in the temple is a major political event which got all the way to Rome and uh, is, is widely noted. Your much smaller events when Thudas or the Egyptian led people out into the desert and 400 or according to some accounts, 4,000 uh, Jews are just simply trampled on by the Roman uh, auxiliary troops. These smaller events are the most you can come up with as a way of trying to show a society on the brink of turmoil. And if we think, you know, we try to think back the last 60 years of turmoil in the United Kingdom, when, I don't know, when we go out this afternoon, um, this evening, and we find that a great uh, race riot has broken out uh, all over London. People will go back through the, uh, um, may it not happen, uh, and they will go back through the uh, newspapers and look for all the examples they can find of race riots in Brixton or in uh, wherever uh, over the last 60 years. And, and they will say, look, it was bound to happen. So that's what Josephus was doing. What he would come up with was actually minimal. And what he would come up with specifically for the time of Pilate was even more minimal. So, so, I mean, of course, it may be just people didn't remember. That's possible. Um, but uh, if you really had a whole series of uh, potential uprisings all the way through for 60 years, uh, it is in the historiographical interest of Josephus to tell us, and he doesn't do so, which is, I think, a reason for taking Tacitus seriously when he says, under Tiberius, all was quiet. That's quite a long answer to a question. Mm. Interesting. I think there may be different points of view in this room, so <laughs> you can expect some uh, conversations over wine uh, later on. <laughs> now, uh, other questions? Yes. So the, yeah, so the question was whether the, the Gospels also have the same anachronistic um, uh, tendency because they're written after the destruction of the temple in 70, assuming, of course, all four of them are. Um, uh, but the answer to that would be, would be yes. 
and that it's quite impossible to write after the destruction of the temple in 70 without being aware of it. Now what it means is that your, your understanding of, of what had happened in the previous history uh, of Judea may vary hugely how it affects your interpretation that it will have an effect is certain. And this, I mean, this is not unique to as a historical problem, the, the, the danger of avoiding anachronism and trying to get back as far as we can to imagine things before everything changed. That's what historians do all the time. It's just very unusual that we find ourselves in this very crucial period of Jewish history for the origins of Christianity without a contemporary source that hasn't been, uh, so to speak, tainted um, by uh, these uh, later knowledge, apart from, uh, from Alexandria, uh, Philo uh, writing from the outside, uh, and he's writing before the destruction. And Philo doesn't particularly care for Pilate. <laughs> Uh, that, you, you can be heard, can't you? Yes. yes. That, 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 this is correct. And as I, I said gently, Pilate was not a nice man. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that he was not a, a good governor. But, 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 but actually, none of the governors of Judea are described as uh, operating effectively, apart from Tiberius Julius Alexander, who was Philo's nephew. Um, and there may be good reasons, and that's not Philo talking about him, this is Josephus, and there are good reasons why he was let off the hook by um, Josephus, because he was likely to be around, or people he knew about him were around at the time um, when Josephus was writing his history. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, so, so all these governors are more or less incompetent, but maybe all Roman governors in most places are, are, are more or less incompetent. Uh, the, the, the interesting question for which Judea is of course, one of our best documented provinces is what extent of, so to speak, grumbling violence and just occasional uh, people getting killed and crucified are expected in Roman provinces just as a matter of, uh, of norm. And that's why I thought that the, as I said, I thought the picture of uh, the uh, unimportance of getting rid of people who are not Roman citizens by crucifixion in the eyes of Roman authorities, uh, at any rate, fits very well for the picture of really very arbitrary use of mass slaughter by Roman forces uh, during the course of the rebellion not always terribly carefully thought through sometimes, because uh, then killing people makes other people rebel. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, we tend, for God jolly good reasons, to empathize a great deal uh, with images of the, the crucifixion and forget how widespread it was. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> So, so, so the question was whether the, the Jewish uh, elite must be doing their job properly um, if the province remains moderately quiet. And I think the answer would be yes. Um, it's not accidental that the descendants of the high priest Ananus, he had five sons who were all high priests. He had a son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was high priest. Um, this, no, this is the real sort of family dynasty. Uh, and why do they go on doing it? It's not because it's an inherited role, it's because they are presumably seen by, uh, in the, this period, in the 30s, by the Roman governors who appoint them, uh, and in later periods by the Herodian kings who appoint them, 
uh, they are seen as competent at doing what they do. And actually, the best evidence that's the case is that a high priest who was not com competent, uh, again, one of the sons, Ananas, son of Ananas, uh, was uh, uh, removed from his post in the year 62 C, summarily, after uh, only six months, because he didn't look up for the job. So, so, so uh, that vital political role of the priesthood as a sort of intervening group between the Roman state and the wider population, uh, most of the time worked in Judea, as it worked most of the time in the rest of the provinces, where there's an elite usually defined in a different way. Uh, did you want to come back? Yes. So, so, so the suggestion was that this confirms the next picture in the Synoptic Gospels, and I think the answer is yes, absolutely. That Caiaphas was doing his job. Again, he doesn't get a lot of sympathy. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the question is uh, uh, about the relationship of diaspora Jews to the Jews in Judea in political terms. So, so why that at some periods they seem to be more involved in what went on in uh, Jerusalem, and at other times they, particularly during the revolt of 66 to 70, singularly failed to come to the aid of the uh, <coughs> defenders of Jerusalem when it came under, under siege uh, in 70. Uh, it, it, it's actually it's a, it's a real puzzle and an interesting one, uh, since it's clear that the Alexandrian Jews in Egypt uh, had been prepared to throw themselves behind the defense of the Jerusalem temple when it came under attack from Gaius Caligula um, in, uh, in uh, 40 and 41 CE. Um, so, when they could see it under direct attack, and the attack was that Gaius wanted to put his statue into the temple so that he could be worshipped, because he wanted everybody to worship him, and he couldn't see why the Jews should be an exception. Uh, that was a clear threat, and they responded in Alexandria and did all over the, uh, the diaspora. Uh, so, so why didn't they defend the temple in, uh, when it came under attack in 70? My own explanation, which is, I guess, uh, is because they didn't actually think it was under as much of a threat as we now know that it was going to be, and that the independent Jewish state that uh, flourished, maybe that's the wrong term, existed in Jerusalem from 66 to 70, issuing its own coins and uh, having its own government within Jerusalem, didn't actually come under direct siege until just uh, four months or so before the, uh, the, the city fell. And so that it was perfectly possible for Jews abroad not to know how serious it all was, and in Jews in Judea to not know how serious it all was, because Jews from the surrounding areas around Jerusalem went up to Jerusalem for the Passover of 70 in large numbers, and then got trapped when the siege of the Romans started. Now, I mean, if we come back, come back to Brian, which we should, um, it, it, it sort of illustrates the point. Even in the middle of a great war, with uh, the Romans by the year 70, with four legions and an equal number of auxiliary troops, so a vast army was in Judea to come and recapture Jerusalem. 
even then, it was possible for Jews to think, well, actually, maybe they're just ignoring us. Uh, and, and, and they did, and they went to, to, to Passover in the temple, and they ended up, ended up uh, dying in the siege as, as a result. So the, the, the picture, which I mean, is very familiar from, I don't know, the, the 1970s, the different places it could have come from. So I don't know whether it has anything to do with what was going on uh, in Ireland, or anything to do with what it was going on in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, but the idea that there would be agents of the state who would be constantly there keeping an eye on you isn't actually the way that uh, Roman provinces normally operated, except after appalling our people. It would be the case that that, that was how Jerusalem operated after the destruction of the temple in 70, when there was a whole legion that was stationed right next to the city. And after that, it would be well worthwhile seeing if you could improve your Latin by writing graffiti on the walls. There is the, uh, the fact that Josephus bookends the war with discussion of what's happening in Alexandria and Egypt and the, the, the establishment of this temple of Onias and then the destruction of it and Leontopolis at, at the end. It, it always seems a little mysterious to me why he's constructed it in, in that way. So he is aware of this relationship with the diaspora community of Alexandria, isn't he? Yes, yeah, he said that. Well, but, but the Alexandrian Jewish community, I mean, had its own problems, which, which were actually rather different from anything in, in Judea. So, uh, uh, goodness knows how much Brian knew about any of this, but um, uh, uh, Alexandria was a huge, great cosmopolitan city that had been the centre of a great empire, and then the empire went away, where the, 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 uh, the royal city of the Ptolemies, as uh, the consumer city, where the Ptolemies left because the Romans took over in 31 BC, it becomes an entrepot instead for all the wealth of Egypt to move through Alexandria to go to Rome. And that leaves the Alexandrians in this sort of massive population, the only city in uh, Egypt, massive population, far bigger than any others in the Mediterranean world, apart from eventually Rome, um, but with no head, so to speak. They had no, they had no uh, uh, real um, sense of identity, didn't even have a council a city council until the year 200 CE. So there was, no, there was nobody really to represent them. And so you have the main city constantly, we're told, in a state of unrest. And the Jews is a very large minority within that city. And so, so the reasons for uh, Jews in Alexandria to have a sort of separate history of unrest and problems. I think, I mean, maybe that explains why they don't come rushing over to help the Jews of Jerusalem. They've got quite enough problems in their own backyard. Um, yes, we can have maybe one more question before our next speaker. So, yes. I'd just like to defend the life of Brian against the thing that he couldn't have been caught uh, right on the wall. The Cephas says there was, a, there was a cohort station in Jerusalem, which is a battalion which would be 800 men. So, although you give a figure, you give a figure for the whole of Israel. Um, in fact, there was 800 men. The Bible claims there was a cohort in, in Jerusalem as well. <coughs> But also in the film, Pilate is in Jerusalem, which suggests that it's a festival day, because you know, Pilate was stationed in, in uh, Caesarea. And Pilate, they make an attack on Pilate's wife in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem. So if Pilate was there, it said, to, Josephus also said that during festival time, more soldiers were brought in. So those events were occurring during the festival time. So, and if you go to Jerusalem, you find that it's a very small place. It's not, it is very likely that he would be caught writing at the point. <laughs> so that's my first point. Shall I deal with that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause, because it's an extremely good point. Um, so so, so the, the, the point is that the, um, if the film is set at the time of the pilgrimage festival, uh, it's at a time when a second cohort was at least by the 60s was being brought in to help to control the population. 
a reasonable suggestion that the same thing might be true also earlier on, because you have a, a very large program influx and they're difficult to control. And therefore, you got double, so uh, uh, probably 600, actually, I think, in the cohort, rather than 800. Um, but so you'd have 1,200 troops in just the city of Jerusalem. So you've got your 1,200 troops, uh, auxiliary troops, uh, with, if we believe the figures from Josephus for the Passover of the year 65, 2 million 700 and something, something, um, two and three quarter million. Uh, pilgrims. Those are just the male ones, so we adult male ones, uh, plus women and children, meaning vast, vast crowds. So actually your problem at pilgrimage time will be getting through the crowds to get to the wall <laughs> in, in, in order to get your graffiti up. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was doing well, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, um, uh, and the... the um, uh, but, but the other thing is, is the placing of these, these cohorts. So when the second cohort came, the first cohort, the resident one, seems to be kept in Herod's palace. And I think that must have started from the beginning, from 6C. Um, and there's, there's a squatting in Herod's palace, um, and, uh, which is down by the Jaffa Gate now. Um, and the other second cohort, at the time of pilgrimage festivals, was in the Herodian, um, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the Antonia, uh, garrison uh, by the uh, temple site. Um, so uh, that for the Antonia garrison, you'd have two lots of people to worry about. You'd have the priests noticing you creeping up with your graffito stick, as well as the, the soldiers. Um, I, of course, you're right. At any time, if you were feeling really um, brave enough, you could go and find, uh, somehow get a, 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 a Roman a, a, an auxiliary soldier to come and correct your Latin. Um, but uh, maybe the pilgrimage festival problem would have been you wouldn't have been alone. But There's just so many people there. The <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, I think, I, sorry, I think we'd better close because otherwise we're not going to be in our time. But I recommend you. you jump on Martin during the, um, <laughs> the reception and, and ask those questions because they're, they're great. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Martin Goodman, for your wonderful presentation today. And it's now my pleasure to call to the lectern Professor George Brook from the University of Manchester, who will speak on Brian as a teacher of righteousness. Thank you for the invitation to uh, speak to this conference. In a way, it's uh, a threesome that I'm going to talk about uh, now, um, with Brian as a teacher of righteousness, but we all know that Brian has this double personality. On Monday, the 23rd of January, 1956, the BBC North of England Home Service broadcast a short talk by John Allegro. The second talk in a series of three. At the end of the talk, Allegro conjectured that the leader of the sectarians who had come to settle at Qumran, the teacher of righteousness, had been crucified there on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea by the Gentile troops of Alexander Janius. For Allegro, the wicked priest who figures in some of the sectarian scriptural commentaries was to be identified as the Jewish king, Janius, active at the start of the first century BCE. The following week, Allegro introduced the third talk as follows. Last week, I said that the leader of this monastic community by the Dead Sea was persecuted and probably crucified by Gentiles at the instigation of a wicked priest of the Jews. For most of us, these events will associate themselves automatically with the betrayal and crucifixion of another master living nearly a century later. The point was clear. Allegro was widely criticized for this conjecture. He had combined pieces of evidence in a particular way to suggest that the teacher of righteousness was some kind of prototype of another master. However, Although the particular details of Allegro's speculation are distinctive and probably incorrect, 
His idea in seeing the role of the sectarian teacher as in some way an anticipation of the role of Jesus was not new. A few years earlier, André dupont sommer had written, everything in the Jewish New Covenant heralds and prepares the way for the Christian New Covenant. The Galilean master, as he is presented to us in the writings of the New Testament, appears in many respects as an astonishing reincarnation of the master of justice. And the idea has endured. But how is the relationship between the teacher and Jesus to be understood? We cannot know whether Jesus ever visited Qumran or any other sectarian settlement, but he could well have known about the sectarians and some aspects of their teachings. There's no clear evidence, however, that Jesus modelled any of his teaching or actions on those of the teacher of righteousness, or that the gospel writers deliberately took the pattern of the teacher amongst others as they configured their various portraits of Jesus. But the teacher of righteousness can be seen as a type of Jewish sectarian leadership, and as such, he needs to be factored in to how any Life of Jesus research might look for the contextual clues. As Eric Idle noted, we all got together and we talked about it a little bit and said, let's do a couple of weeks research. So we all went off and read the Bible and I read the Dead Sea Scrolls and books on the Bible. Then we met again and decided what this could be about. I think we realized at that point we couldn't make a film about Jesus Christ because he's not particularly funny. <laughs> what he's saying isn't mockable. It's very decent stuff, perhaps even his jokes, Joan. You can't take the piss out of it. But the idea of somebody who is mistaken for a messiah came out. And I think that's how that process started. A similar recollection has been attributed to Michael Palin. We read books about the Bible story and that period, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and various new interpretations of the Gospels. So this is my purpose here, to think about someone whom some of that ancient Jewish sectarian movement, and also some modern scholars, have taken or mistaken for an eschatological figure, even a prophet or a messiah, and to wonder whether Brian can assist our thinking. After all, the study of reception history is as much about how later readings might help the better understanding of earlier phenomena as they are about the history of interpretation itself. So the life of Brian as a cultural marker. Two matters are worth mentioning briefly concerning the life of Brian as a cultural marker one larger and one more specific. First, the history of research on the teacher of righteousness reveals that in the first 35 years or so, from 1947 until about 1980, there was a dominant concern with trying to identify the teacher with some historical person, notably as the unnamed high priest of 159 to 153 BCE and with recognizing him as the author of some of the sectarian compositions. Those concerns have not gone away, but they now play a minor role when compared with interests in the teacher since the 1980s. The shift of interest that took place in the 80s can be seen in the discussion of the authorship of the composition entitled Miktsat Ma'asei HaTorah. As information on this composition began to emerge in the mid-1980s, the proposal was that this epistolary summary of various legal decisions, together with some moral exhortation, had been penned by the teacher of righteousness and sent to his rival outside the sect, probably a Jerusalem leader. This idea was quickly challenged, and few, if any, would defend the identification now it is recognized as too historicist, an over-reading of what might be knowable about the composition and its origins. In fact, the authorial voice of MMT is the first plural person, uh, personal pronoun, we, not a singular, as might be expected if the teacher were indeed the author. Two dimensions of the discussion of the scrolls are indicative of this change in a more positive scholarly fashion. 
On the one hand, the Damascus document, the major sectarian rulebook in which the teacher figures, was dissected into its parts and layers, and the attempt to read the opening admonition as a naive historical summary was seen to be problematic. On the other hand, there was reconsideration of the Pusharim, the sectarian biblical commentaries, that are the only other textual source for explicit information about the teacher. In general, they are no longer understood as principally about the early 2nd century BCE history of the sectarian movement, but rather as some kind of quasi-prophetic literary phenomenon of the late 1st century BCE. This change is attested in another way. So, for example, by the time of the 50th anniversary of the 1947 discovery of Cave 1, a collection of studies describing the state of the question, the Dead Sea Scrolls after 50 years, had no room at all for an article on the teacher. The teacher, whose identity was never very secure in the first place, seemed to be losing his identity altogether. More recently, he's been reimagined as a prototypical uh, figure of sectarian identity, and he's been heard rather than seen as the traditions about him have been discussed in terms of the echoes of his voice rather than his historical persona. Why mention this history of scholarship and the evolution of thinking about the teacher? In his recent book on the Bible in silent film, David Shepherd has astutely noted that there is an analogy between what happens to the epic depiction of biblical narratives in the silent era and in that of sound. For Shepherd, I quote, the appearance of Monty Python's life of Brian following a long line of earnest cinematic depictions of Christ in the 60s and 70s was an indication of the exhaustion of the biblical epic that sought to represent matters historically on an ever grander scale. While others are better qualified to discuss the life of Brian as marking a, a moment of cultural change in relation to life of Jesus research, it certainly seems to be the case that the film is a leading indicator of several features of a cultural shift which itself is eventually reflected in scholarship on the teacher of righteousness. That shift is a move away from somewhat narrow historicist concerns towards larger questions of textual and other kinds of construal and misconstrual. It's also partly a move away from history as a sequence of grand moments towards narrative as reflecting the everyday. It's also a move away from any attention to the divine in Jesus to the human in Brian. Perhaps with Brian representing Jesus' humanity in an encrypted form. In fact, on that score, the teacher is a much better quasi-messianic archetype for juxtaposition with Brian than Jesus is since there was never any claim that the teacher was divine. By moving beyond historicism with the mood of the moment, Brian puts humanity at the top of the agenda of theological discourse. The more specific item concerning how the life of Brian has become a cultural marker for Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship concerns a recent exhibition. Mladen Popovich of the University of Groningen was the curator of the major exhibition on the scrolls and related artifacts at the Drents Museum in Assen. The exhibition, not surprisingly, had no mention of the teacher of righteousness in any of its literature or displays. But in addition to some scrolls and various archeological artifacts from contemporary Judea, one large room was devoted to the Herodian and Roman periods. On one wall, above and between display cases, was the following vertical list in large letters. And you can guess what I'm going to say. Water system, aqueduct, medicine, roads, irrigation, wine, and education. When showing visitors around, the curator delighted in testing their wider understanding of what the list represented. It was, of course, a representation of the answer to Reggie's question. He had also set up a wider intertextual reading for the Conoscenti, for in place of also listing peace, 
which features as the climax of the list offered by Xerxes and others in the film, the exhibition displayed on the opposite wall a very threatening and deathly flock of flying arrowheads. It's now the case, quite clearly, that the life of Brian is a significant cultural discourse partner, even in the study of the scrolls, and this should not be surprising. After all, the Pisons had done more than most of my students do. They'd actually gone away and read the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> From the brief history of scholarship mentioned above, we've noted that the figure of the teacher of righteousness has moved from being an unnamed but unidentifiable historical figure to being just an authoritative voice. What really is known about the teacher of righteousness? And is there anything uh, that can be understood better through juxtaposition with Brian? Michael Nibb says, the sobriquet teacher of righteousness is given in the Dead Sea Scrolls to the individual who is commonly believed to have played the decisive role in the formation and early history of the group, assumed here to be a scene that lies behind the scrolls. The sobriquet is widely understood as being a play on the end of the phrase in Joel 2.23, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. Hamore litzadaka. Like much else in the sectarian compositions, in some way, the teacher's designation is a fulfillment of prophecy. References to him are limited to the Damascus document and four of the sectarian scriptural commentaries, the Pesharim, one each on Habakkuk and Micah, and two on the Psalms. The extant copies of the Pesharim date to the second half of the first century BCE, and the texts themselves were most likely composed at that time. The Damascus document is extant in multiple copies from the Qumran caves, and is widely thought to have had a longer pedigree, even going back at least in part, to the second half of the second century BCE. If the designation teacher of righteousness in the Damascus document does indeed refer to an historical individual, then the description of him as belonging to the second generation of a Jewish reform movement and becoming the focal point of its formation is indeed not unlikely. How the teacher became a prominent leader in the movement is not clear. Was he a mere stooge, a parodic leader, as Philip Davies has indicated on Brian. At least, as with Brian, these things just happen when people with various expectations and aspirations transfer them to an individual. But more significantly, in the light of the depiction of Brian's experience, what is transferred is indeed to be recognized as a matter of projection. For Jesus, Brian challenges the viewer to look again at the evidence without all the projected baggage of the churches. For the teacher of righteousness, by implication, Brian poses the question as to how much scholars have really understood the character of what is being projected onto him by the composers and compilers of the Damascus document and some of the Pusharim. The references to the teacher of righteousness in the sectarian scriptural commentaries deserve a little bit of further consideration. As mentioned, they're likely composed at the end of the first century BCE. What is it uh, about the teacher, perhaps a figure from the second century, that the compilers of these texts thought should be remembered or constructed about him? In his study of the Teacher of Righteousness Remembered, Lawrence Stuckenbrook has outlined six items that were probably thought significant about the teacher as his memory was constructed. He was identified as a priest in the commentary on Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. Secondly, the teacher is described as an interpreter of authoritative scriptures, in particular, According to Pesha Habakkuk, the teacher of righteousness is the one to whom God made known 
all the mysteries of his servants, the prophets. The teacher is probably being set up then as the role model and authorization for exactly the kind of prophetic interpretation that Pesha Habakkuk contains. Thirdly, the teacher is also remembered as a founding figure. He's the one who built the congregation, according to Pesha Psalms. Fourth, the teacher is remembered for his conflict with the man of the lie. It's highly likely that such remembrance reflects a desire for the audience of the commentaries to believe that they are on the side of particular truth claims over against various falsehoods. This is the rhetoric of sectarian rivalry or even inner sectarian group fighting. And fifth, the teacher also opposed the wicked priest, a character whose activity is not always linked to the teacher and so may represent an ongoing contemporary conflict with priests elsewhere, maybe an outsider conflict. And lastly, the teacher of righteousness is remembered as just that. His sobriquet is a marker of instruction that is righteous. Without overstating the case, the life of Brian highlights several similar issues and forces the reader of the scrolls to recognize at least some of the dynamics through which the sectarian commentaries were created. First, there's the problem of Brian's own lineage, which Jones already mentioned. Mandy has to break it to him early on that his father might not be Mr. Cohen that is, Mr. Priest, but a Roman centurion, a feature of several later Jewish traditions about Jesus. Though obviously crafted with an eye on the identity of Jesus' parents, the discussion between mother and son evokes the question about whether it's enough for the sectarian teacher simply to be identified as a priest. The teacher is not explicitly named. Stukenbrook boldly states, not anonymous to the community, he is anonymous to us who are outsiders, and more importantly, he remains without a proper name in the world of the texts. I cannot avoid wondering to what extent the very commonality of the name Brian creates a kind of anonymity, a space onto which it's all the easier for the aspirations of others to be projected. He's a virtual nobody, who is constructed by others. Second, there's no extensive biography of the sectarian teacher. As the one to establish or confirm a school of thought, sometimes likened to Pythagoras, some further biographical details might be expected. In many instances, we know more about founding figures than is the case with this teacher. What we do seem to know cannot be constructed into a consecutive narrative biography. Almost every item in the Damascus document and the sectarian commentaries has now been deconstructed and thought to reflect the concerns and ideological traits of those who wrote such documents. And although the historians of Jesus have undertaken similar deconstructions of their subject, they have forever been tempted to put the story back together often, as has commonly been pointed out, constructing a Jesus in their own image. With the life of Brian, such deconstruction is brought into sharp focus, both for Jesus, who becomes a misheard figure in the distance and whose healings cause economic setbacks for those healed, and for Brian, who is misunderstood by his mother and by nearly everybody else, the question arises concerning how anything in a potential teacher's biography might be assembled. Some few scholars keep trying to create the teacher's biography and a very clearly mapped history of the early community, but they are just the kind of scholars who have not been to see the life of Brian. Third, little or no teaching remains. Unless, as is widely supposed, some significant parts of the Thanksgiving hymns were composed by this founding figure, then the readers of the Damascus document and the sectarian commentaries are left with the need to make the jump from what is offered in those texts by way of legal and prophetic interpretation to supposing that it was instigated or certainly was in tune with what the teacher said. 
What did Brian actually say or do that resulted in him being pushed forwards into the particular role, aspects of which he somewhat reluctantly eventually agrees to play? There is a little teaching that is deliberately poor imitation of some kind, and eventually leads to the audience deciding that he's not saying much of value. At which point, a youth arrives on the scene as Brian is trying to extricate himself from speaking and wants to know what Brian isn't sharing with his audience. It must be a secret, even the secret of eternal life. Then there's a gourd and a sandal. After some further action, there is the denial scene in which Brian's denial is taken as proof of his divinity. In a similar way, we might wonder about what the teacher of righteousness was imitating, perhaps poorly, and whether the teacher of the scrolls ever agreed or even hinted at the kinds of things that were later projected back onto him. Just where are the continuities and discontinuities in the voice of the teacher? Fourth, the teacher is useful in a time of conflict. Discourse about him helps people not only to take the right side, but also, once on the right side, to be part of a core group. Perhaps there are ideological conflicts of various kinds so frequently that the concomitant need for such a teacher is common enough. In the life of Brian, the factionalism of the Jewish resistance to Rome is highlighted, perhaps overemphasized, in the squabbles between the Judean People's Front and the People's Front of Judea, and whatever happened to the Popular Front, and is a reflection of the types of internecine struggle that is only too common amongst resistance movements, especially religious ones. Philip Davies has suggested that the life of Brian is entirely in accord with the fragmentation and mutual loathing of Jewish resistance groups, as indicated by Josephus. In some periods, the movement behind the sectarian scrolls seems to have been no exception. There was factionalism within it at some stage or stages, the existence of traitors, as is reflected in the very same texts as the present the teacher to us. And there was antagonism against both those who were resisting Rome and those who were accommodating themselves to Gentile authority. And then there is an issue not just about right teaching, but also about truth claims what might be better labelled as revelation. It's claimed in Pesha Habakkuk that God made known to the teacher all the mysteries of his servants, the prophets. But did the teacher ever claim that for himself? And if not, how did it come about that his words were understood as in some way inspired or revelatory? Who decides these things? In the life of Brian, it's quite clear that it is audiences who assign authority to words and sayings, who hear and don't hear, and who mishear. There is a major question left for any hearer. Do I ascribe authority to what I have heard, and on what grounds? All that's been mentioned based on how the teacher was remembered is taken a stage further when it comes to the construction of identity. In a neat little article on the Pusharim, Yuta Yokiranta has summarized several aspects of social identity theory and applied them to the teacher of righteousness. She makes two principal observations, one concerning the teacher as a persecuted person and one concerning the teacher as privileged. She argues that these two identity markers are what result in the modern reader being able to identify the similarities between the teacher and the social in-group responsible for the texts. Social identity theory then supports the claim that the teacher is constructed as a prototype of the identity of much later groups and individuals. First then, persecution. The persecution of the teacher is a well-recognized feature of the Pusharim. Yoki Ranta's point is that this mirrors the experiences of the in-group described in the same texts. As the teacher is oppressed by the wicked priest, so that in-group is also hard-pressed at the hands of the stereotyped wicked outsider. This makes the teacher's experience prototypical for the identity of the in-group 
even though such experience might be the construct of those writing the texts. It's intriguing to see how negative experience is turned into a positive identity marker. That is, um, uh, of course, a, a common phenomenon. The lack of the experience of violence, that is, of being violated, can lead to a loss of identity. The same is true the other way round, as violence feeds a particular sense of self, even self-worth. <clears throat> Second, what of privilege? The claims to elect status of the sectarian movement behind the scrolls have been widely recognised. Yoki Ranta suggests that the key matter in this respect concerns the correct interpretation of scripture. Whilst for the prototypical teacher this is principally constructed around the interpretation of the prophets, for the movement itself it's the right interpretation of the Torah that is of major significance. In either case, scripture is used to justify deviance from societal norms. What of Brian? Is he prototypical in any way? Two things come to mind. On the one hand, the sense of confusion in his self-understanding and amongst those who encounter him suggests that the film constructs uh, uh, confusion rather than persecution as a major identity marker of messianic movements and those on whom they project their aspirations. That confusion is intricately interwoven with chance circumstances arising out of the Roman occupation and where people happen to be at particular moments. Confusion and accident are significantly those very factors that are usually forgotten by scholars who attempt to reconstruct social movements and their founders. Social history should not all be written in terms of neat chains of deliberately intended cause and effect. There are always matters beyond the control of those involved and multiple factors that are never recorded. Only making a film of what could have happened in which the circumstantial and the misunderstood is privileged can an audience perceive the reality of things as far more complex than any single text could ever represent? Brian puts the mess back into messianism. <laughs> as Mandy explicitly states in a mocking aside, if you obviously didn't remember this, I actually had it in my subconscious because I used that uh, particular pun in an article I wrote without acknowledging the Pythons. On the other hand, the prototypical characterization of Brian seems to lie in another direction than that of the constructed teacher of righteousness. The Pythons project onto Brian a somewhat convoluted insistence on individualism. In preaching that people should really make up their own minds and live their lives their own way, Brian inadvertently risks subverting himself and creating a movement inspired by such a message, just what he is preaching against. For the sectarian teacher, the construction of identity is not for the sake of individualism. It's intriguing, in fact, how very few proper names survive amongst the 250 sectarian scrolls. But for a group identity of some sort, perhaps the sort through which the marginalized, even including some who could be counted as elite, might justify their group deviance from social norms. Where have we got to? What are we left with? Well, I've not mentioned sex, but that's partly because there's a lot of discourse about sex, both in the scrolls and in Brian, but in the scrolls it's not associated directly with the teacher of righteousness. Whatever might the, the case might be about his sexuality, the teacher was not the Messiah, though like Brian, some people might have thought that he was. Likewise, he was not a prophet, though like Brian, some people might have wished to highlight his prophetic characteristics. Perhaps in the end, like Brian in his mother's view, he was simply a very naughty boy. But that depends upon whom you might have asked or might ask nowadays. In the end, all I've done is to try to make a case that the life of Brian is an indispensable foundation to any student's career in the study of the scrolls.
any questions for Professor Brook? Yes. So that the, uh, the question is a, is a comment, really, uh, that Jesus, Brian, and the teacher of righteousness uh, are all pastiches of uh, other people's texts, uh, in a way, a construction uh, um, at second or third hand of um, other people's texts. And I think that's um, a nice way of putting it, Jonathan, because actually... Uh, what I tried to indicate is that in some ways the teacher, uh, because we kind of assume him to be a founding figure, uh, is often even conceptualized as a, somebody who's starting from scratch. But actually he belongs almost certainly within a long tradition. Uh, most people would certainly identify Jubilees and Enoch and other things in that tradition, which are providing... Uh, all kinds of literary tropes and interpretations of authoritative texts themselves which then get taken forward. Now if the teacher might well have contributed to that but almost certainly it's the construction of the teacher in later texts as I've tried to indicate that um, allows us to see that. Now I don't know about Brian there doesn't seem to be a lot of tradition there. I think probably he was a gin drinker, judging by the juniper bush. Uh, one or two other things lying in the background. But certainly for Jesus, uh, it's the case that very much has been done to try to protect the originality and uniqueness and distinctiveness of Jesus, which largely comes, to my mind, from um, a, a, a preference for the Christ of faith approach to this figure, rather than trying to conceptualize how it might have worked through accident and chance historically, as the life of Brian is trying to indicate. And there, I think, one has to say the scrolls really do help um, provide us with uh, trajectories of interpretation of traditions, such as now that we've got uh, the so-called 4Q Beatitudes texts, we can see that it would be entirely plausible for Jesus to use the form of Beatitudes, even some uh, particular phraseology which was traditional in the utterance of Beatitudes, and that what we have in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain is not a completely original construct. Um, I've even tried to suggest in a, in a, in a uh, one or two things I've written, that possibly Matthew's form of the Beatitudes is more original than Luke's because of the way in which it plays upon received tradition. So yes, uh, your comment is uh, spot on. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just going back to the Brian, it's slightly confusing, it was sadly, it was sadly filled, but um, there is, when he falls down onto the prophet, in life of life. He's being chased by the soldiers, and there's a soldier guarding the speakers on the platform. So that's why he starts speaking, because he's frightened that the soldier will recognize him. Then he's in the middle of a speech when, say, remember the lilies and all this, or what the birds are there, when the whole soldier, a lot of soldiers, arrive with, uh, with John, and he panics and starts saying something. The soldiers march away, carrying the soldier that he was on guard away. Brian is then free to walk off. So he stops in his speech and doesn't deliver the final line that they were waiting for. Now this equates with the idea of the Gnostics. Don't give information out. The information is only for initiates. And in fact, Brian is showing that if you don't give information out, everybody wants to know what you were going to say. If you tell them, nobody wants to know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you very much um, for putting the record straight about the precise um, uh, sequence. In, in that particular 
uh, section of the film. But of course, Brian does get to say things or not say things at other times yeah, yeah. in the moments uh, uh, through the film as well. And it's uh, a sort of um, putting together several of those different instances which led me to uh, yeah, no, no, construct no, things in the way that I did. So that the reason why you may not be getting much of the doctrine is because it may be initiation which you get the doctrine. And why the Betis gods you say there's not much about the doctrine, it may be simply because they're not allowed to put the doctrine into the, into the documents because you have to be initiated into that information. And certainly the Gnostics, and I think Jesus is always saying, uh, let them who can see, you know, understand this. You know, he says it after the feeding of the 5,000. He says, let those who understand, let them understand it. You know, so initiation is, a, is an, or hidden knowledge is important. Obviously the Pythagoreans. Uh, not everybody is supposed to know uh, everything. This is the saying of the Pythagoreans. Right, so how do I make that into a question? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is the absence, of, the absence of information in the Dead Sea Scrolls about what they believe could be because you have to be initiated. Yeah, that there's plenty in the Dead Sea Scrolls about what they believed. What the absence is, is what the teacher actually said. Right, right. Um, so uh, you could be right that there is an absence of what the teacher actually said because it was only for the uh, elites who had been initiated. It was, it was secret it was stuff for the insider. Um, I, uh, I'm not so sure about that because uh, of several reasons. One is when they really wanted to write secrets, it seems as if they were quite capable of using cryptic alphabets. So we have several cryptic texts um, which might have been used when a member of this sectarian movement was going from one place to another and was frightened that he might get accosted uh, so these secrets wouldn't get into uh, people's hands because they would need a, a decoding device. Um, so it would be quite easy, in fact, for somebody to compile the uh, teacher's words into uh, a document like that. So, to my mind, the absence of um, what the teacher might have actually said um, uh, is an indication that the texts which are talking about the teacher are primarily talking about themselves. Uh, they are constructs of a distant figure. They can't uh, have access to what he said simply because he's too distant. Thank you. Uh, just one, one, can we just have one yeah, yeah. more question, Julian? <laughs> okay, any other questions, actually, now that I've said that? Um, okay. Um, so you, the question is uh, whether the possible additions to uh, the sequence of uh, parables, particularly the parable of the sower in Mark 4, uh, is an indication of the author of that section of the gospel trying to imitate something about the teacher making something known. Is that how I'm meant to understand what you're saying? Uh, I think that's highly unlikely. Um, uh, I would um, wonder myself, in fact, whether what we discern in some of the scrolls doesn't lead us to suppose uh, possibly the reverse, namely that Jesus could have been responsible for interpreting some of his words to an insider group. Um, and that was known as a possibility uh, in some textual traditions. 
So uh, I think when we juxtapose the scrolls with the New Testament, maybe in the light of the life of Brian, but maybe not, um, we begin to uh, see that actually far more in the Gospels becomes plausible as a genuine construct of Jesus than might otherwise be supposed. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to be very rigid about timekeeping, uh, and all our chairs are instructed to be similarly very careful. So let me simply just thank Professor Brooke for his very insightful and interesting paper. And let me invite you now to go upstairs and enjoy uh, a wonderful reception of wine and canapes. And we will reconvene here uh, at 7.30 for the next part of your entertainment. So please don't be late. Please come back here for 7.30. Thank you.